Today on the show, I'm going to keep this one short, sweet, to the point. You probably can already tell from the headline of this episode what it's going to be about. I'm going to make the argument here now today that the Seahawks roster on March 20th, 2024 is better than the roster that finished the regular season last year. I'll give you my thoughts, my reasoning, tell you why, up next on Seahawks Forever. Welcome to the Seahawks Forever podcast, in-depth analysis on everything Seahawks. And now, here's your host, Dan Viennes. Welcome back to the show, everybody. Uh, for those of you who subscribe and have been watching for a long time, really appreciate the support. For first-time viewers, hit that like button, subscribe to the channel, hit the bell so you always get notification of new episodes. And if you prefer to listen to audio episodes, you can do it on whichever platform you prefer. Make sure to subscribe so you don't miss anything. But also, if you want to hear episodes without ads, you can do so on Spotify. You can subscribe now. The monthly fee, not kidding, less than a dollar a month. You can also just support me and the show by buying me a coffee or a beer. All those links will be in the description. So it is March 20th. We are, well, we're not done with free agency. There are still quite a few interesting free agents out there. The draft is a month away now, a little over a month away, but I will say this. I think the Seahawks are done. I think they are finished making let's call it the heavy lifting of the free agency period. There still might be a couple of guys that come along that maybe they're not expecting that turn out to be great value. But I think they're done. And 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 for as much as we have been opining, wondering over the last couple of months, how, if at all, things will be different this offseason with John Schneider operating solo now with autonomy, without veto rights um, standing beside him in the form of Pete Carroll, executive vice president of, of player personnel, and and uh, had contractual veto rights. Um, as much as John, you know, was adamant that uh, really didn't come into play that often, that, that Pete left him alone to run the draft the way he saw fit, there's still a different... It's a different process, right? Because it's a different coaching staff. And, and you want to maximize the ability of your coaching staff by giving them the tools to succeed, by, by giving them players that they want, that they endorse, and that fits what they want to do. And um, I will tell you this. I got, a, I got a chance to talk to John tonight a little bit. We got to talk ball a little bit. And one of the things he said that struck me is um, – he just talked about how much he's enjoying the process. And he used a term, uh, he talked about getting to know the coaching staff and it's a whole new dynamic in the building, but you know, he's, he's an evaluator. That's, that's the main part of that's the crux of his job. And I think it's the thing he, he enjoys the most is the evaluation process. And he, he called it evaluating the evaluators that he's getting to know now uh, a new set of eyes and uh, a new way of thinking. And then trying to take everything he knows about player evaluation, getting ready for the free agency period in the draft and adapting it to these new ideas. And I have I began feeling this way a few days ago that that I thought the moves made in free agency, you know, we were a little a little concerned those first few days, right? Inactivity is always concerning because we want answers. It's the unknown that's Sometimes it can be enticing, but this time of year, especially given that the Seahawks entered into the free agency period with the least number of contracted players of any team in the league, a little concerning. Like we literally had major holes on the roster and that salary cap room only goes so far. You know, it's one thing to have $50 million in cap space and have 60 players under contract and have $50 million in cap space and have 38 players under contract. But I started feeling really good about things last Friday. And then the moves they've made this week, more under the radar kind of variety, just confirm for me what I said at the top. I believe that this roster, there's two ways to look at it. From March 20th last year, I think it's dramatically better. Remember this time a year ago, they essentially didn't have 
the pieces of an entire defensive line. You know, they still had guys like Miles Adams on the roster, but they had signed Draymond Jones and they had signed Jaron Reed in free agency. And that was it. Mario Edwards wasn't added until just before training camp. And, and obviously the draft hadn't come around yet. And we were, remember how worried we were going into the draft that they needed. They had painted themselves into, into a corner, I think was the term I used at the time. Like they needed to get a couple of defensive linemen out of that draft just to fill out the room. So not only are, are, in my opinion, are we dramatically better than we were precisely one year ago today, but I think this roster is better than the one that finished the season. And let's just get right into this. I want to take this away so that I can share this with you and show it to you. That's what it looks like today. We have 68 uh, players under contract currently. So 90 man roster, right? Or 65 players. I'm sorry. 90 man roster leaves. Uh, quick math, 25. <laughs> if if you assume, so you're far cry from a week and a half ago when they had less than 40. It's now you figure if they stand pat with where they are on the draft now, that seven more leaves you, what, 18 undrafted free agents? A typical class is about 20, 15 to 20. And like I said, there may still be a couple of veteran additions as we even continue into free agency and guys aren't signed and come at great value. But let's just go kind of position group by position group. But let's start on the defense because that was the biggest concern last year at the end of the season is, is the way that defensive unit finished the season in particular. But let's go position group by position group. Defensive line. And these numbers that you see here, so uh, the numbers by each position are, are numbers that they typically – start out with uh, at the 53-man roster. I looked back at the last two finalized 53-man rosters to start the season, and this was the breakdown, essentially. So, And you can mix and match, right? So when I say four defensive tackles, four defensive ends, it's eight defensive linemen, and, and some of those are classified as edge. That line is kind of blurred. There's a more gray area there, but just look at that defensive line group, let's call it. As I mentioned, you know, you have Jaron Reed, Leonard Williams comes back. That was huge. Draymond Jones, a healthy Mike Morris now, playing for a guy who was his defensive coordinator at Michigan two years ago. You know, 6'6", 300 pounds, coming off a season to get mental reps and kind of get used to the, the pro game, but without being able to play because of that shoulder injury. And then the guys I have in green are guys that that as of today, I would say are are locks for the roster, essentially. You can see down here in the lower left-hand corner, there's 37 of those. And for those of you listening on audio, I'll try to make this as detailed as possible. But you have those five. You still have Miles Adams. You still have Matt Gotell, who played in the last couple of games last year and, and showed you know that big. For some reason, I had added uh, Jonathan Hankins in here, and he didn't show up uh, on the spreadsheet here. I apologize for that. But then you add that player. 31 years old, a grizzled veteran, a guy who has been one of the better run-stuffing defensive tackles slash nose tackles in the league. And the Seahawks have such a long and storied history of adding that type of player later in their career. Those guys can play into their early and mid-30s. Al Woods is the most famous example, but remember Tony McDaniel. And so that group, you can make an argument is, is darn near intact. Now, I think they're going to draft there. They're going to add. And that's something to consider, too, as you go through these is, is think about where we are today. And then let's add a little bit of upside to that as well. You know, it's very possible that with the 16th pick or later on in the first round, if they trade down, they could add a Johnny Newton or a Byron Murphy or a Darius Robinson. Pretty enticing idea. And so I think there's no question that that position group is better now than it was at the end of the year because you're adding a healthy Mike Morris. Cam Young has another year under his belt, as does Miles Adams. He's still only 25 years old. Feels like he's been around for a while. And you're adding Jonathan Hankins to that group as well. Outside linebacker slash edge, whatever you want to call it. You bring back that room completely intact, including Daryl Taylor, who you reworked his contract, so there's almost no guaranteed money on it now. He may be a trade piece. You know, it'd be interesting to see how the draft goes. That that third day of the draft, the edge quality really drops off. Maybe there will be some 
some interest there. But, you know, a guy that's going to be motivated, maybe Mike McDonald has told John Schneider, hey, I think I can do something with this guy. Derek Hall, another year under his belt. Boy, Amafe really took a step forward last year. And then you get Uchenna Nuosu back, who missed, you know, the bulk of the season last year. So that group, better than it was at the end of last year. I'm going to come back to linebacker because that's obviously where there was the most change. Cornerback, don't need to talk about this very long. Brought back the entire position group completely intact, including Artie Burns. You know, a veteran presence, a guy who can play all three positions. Now safety. You make the big move at the beginning of the offseason to cut Jamal Adams and cut Quandre Diggs and, and, and start to balance out salary allocation now. It was really out of whack. We've seen the last two seasons the devaluation financially of the safety position. And the Seahawks were completely out of balance when it came to that versus the rest of the league. Well, now they've brought that back into play, but they go out and replace those guys with a couple of really solid. And now I see what happened here because this is missing as well. So Julian Love is back after a Pro Bowl season. Ray Sean Jenkins signed from the Jaguars, 30 year old safety. Really solid player. I watched an interview the other day with uh, somebody who covers the Jaguars, and they said, this guy's just going to bring his lunch pail every day. He's going to be great in the locker room. He's versatile. He can do a lot of things. You're just going to like this guy as a player. Kobe Bryant, a guy who I thought we saw some really cool things from last year in preseason when they moved him to safety. And then Kayvon Wallace, who was just signed this week, another puzzle piece, you know, another kind of – just versatile player who's played slot, free, strong. You can really move those guys around. A guy who, if you read the press release from the Seahawks today, I think it came out, he was officially signed today. And it, it looked like a script out of Seahawks front office one-on-one. We just talked about the culture here and you know how, how he's tough, smart, dependable, reliable, all the buzzwords the Seahawks like to use. So Kayvon Wallace also on that list. I think, you know, Quandre Diggs has a lot of fans out there. You could argue that you believe the talent level of this group isn't quite as high. The ceiling isn't as high, but when you take Adam's injury history into it, into it and you, you compare these other players that were brought in, this is a more dependable group, more versatile group, more interchangeable, which is what we know about Mike McDonald, right? One of the things that's made him so successful as a coordinator is is operating a scheme where the offense just doesn't know where it's coming from. The, the, it's harder to point out at the line of scrimmage who's doing what. And I think this group might play a little bit more into that. And then we'll talk about, let's talk about the inside linebackers, right? Bobby Wagner is a legend. One of the great Seahawks of all time. One of my favorite Seahawks and one of my favorite people who has ever played for the Seahawks of all time. But if you take emotion out of it, you have to admit he's a, an aging player who's declining in skills. Teams were picking on him from a coverage standpoint. It was time once and for all to move on. And then Jordan Brooks was a very polarizing player. Some people would, would pound the table and tell you that Seahawks should have brought him back at whatever cost because he was on the verge of putting it all together, on the verge of being a Pro Bowl player. But he got away. So you have to react to that. You have to go out and do the best you can in the free agent market, try to replace that. And when you when you look at where the NFL has, what the NFL has become offensively, and how the inside linebacker position has evolved. Yeah, you still have to be able to get up there and stick your nose in against the run. And in, in, in that aspect, Bobby Wagner is still doing it as well as anyone in the league. PFF had him as the second-ranked run defender in the league last year at the linebacker position. Um, Brooks, not as good. But it's about covering, and that's really... When you were watching the Seattle defense the last couple of years, especially last year, it wasn't just their inability against the run that was frustrating. It was covering the middle of the field. Covering those in-breaking routes. Tight end slot receivers. 
the stuff the Rams were doing to us over and over and over again. You remember that first game, just Puka Nakua over and over. Who's this guy? Over and over again. 15-yard ins, ins, ins. And that's not all on the linebacker. But there were so many times. Remember how bad they were third and longs. And a lot of times that's where teams would pick on us. Middle of the field. In coverage, you'd have a real hard time winning an argument that the combination of Brooks and Wagner were better than Terrell Dodson and Jerome Baker. According to PFF last year, in uh, in coverage, Terrell Dodson third in the league in his 10 starts, Jerome Baker 18th in the league, so both of them top 20. Bobby Wagner, Jordan Brooks, back-to-back, 46th and 47th. Uh, was their coverage grade, respectfully, from PFF. So I would argue that in that aspect, a very important aspect, they've upgraded. And the sum of these parts is better than the sum of the parts of the linebackers uh, that we that we let go away. And so I think it's pretty clear that this defensive lineup is better today than it was at the end of last season. On offense, there's one major question mark. We'll get to that last. But if you go, again, position group by position group, starting quarterback, Geno Smith comes back. You've swapped out Drew Locke for Sam Howell. I think in some ways, similar profile, right? Outstanding arm talent, both of them. Kind of gunslinger mentality in some ways. Locke probably a little bit more athletic overall. uh, Although Howell can certainly move around and run. Um, and they both early in their career struggled a little bit with turnovers, but I think how being younger, I personally think that his skill set and, and, and his, his potential career arc, I think might be better long-term than Drew Locke, but whichever you prefer it, if, if you prefer Locke over how it's, it's fine. I think it's close either way. Right. And you've saved some money there. You could have brought Locke back for five, six million dollars. Instead, you get Howell for one. That's a win. But just in, in terms of pure talent, I would argue Howell's better. But if you want to take Locke, you can you can do that here. Running back room essentially intact. DJ Dallas gets away. I've called him a replacement level player before. That's not a knock on him. That just means that you can find DJ Dallas is out there. They signed Bryant Kobach again, who spent some time in the practice squad last year. They'll probably draft a guy late or sign a guy in undrafted free agency, or just this might be one of those areas where they grab another veteran off the free agent market after everything is kind of settled down. You get bargain basement prices because there's always running backs available. Wide receiver room intact, right? Completely intact. They even brought D Eskridge back for one more year, reworked his deal. Very similar to Daryl Taylor, less money, but they basically took away the guarantees. Got to earn it, kid. You know, new staff thinks you might have a shot to be a contributor. Let's see what you can do. Derek Young's still there. They swap out Cody Thompson for Cody White. Aesop Winston Jr. You know, it's the exact same group that ended last season. The tight end group. Uh, Noah Fant is back and presumably will be featured and used more to his ability and his potential. To me, that's a win. And then Farrell Brown is brought in. Consider the Seahawks say they think he's the best blocking tight end in the league. That, that might be a little bit hyperbolic. Like I think we would all agree that that's probably George Kittle. But still, he's probably every bit, if not a little bit better, blocker than Will Disley was. And then Brady Russell, he was on the roster last year. At the end of last year, there's some upside there. Tyler Mabry's back again. So you lose Colby Parkinson, replace him with, with essentially Brady Russell. Farrell Brown, you could say, kind of takes over that blocking tight end spot for Will Disley. But I think... I, again, I would argue that that the tight end situation at worst is as good as last year and may potentially be better because Noah Fant's going to be used to the best of his ability and now they're going to unlock that ceiling. And then we get into the offensive line. And this is where, where people are still nervous. And I get it. If we knew that Abe Lucas was going to make a full recovery from his knee procedure, which we still, nobody knows what the procedure was, how severe it was, a little cleanup, a little meniscus, a little loose bodies. Was it a scope? Was it a full reconstruction? Nobody knows. If we knew he was healthy enough 
then it would change this equation, right? But still, I think they they hedged against that in about the safest way possible by bringing in a really solid veteran like George Fan, who has proven to be durable and good at a, at a pretty low cost when you consider his cap hit for the first year of that two-year deal. Charles Cross, I think some would say took a step back last year. I'm not sure he was ever 100% healthy coming back off that toe injury because it just seemed like there were times that his get off off the line of scrimmage just wasn't as wasn't as sharp, wasn't as strong. He's lost a little bit of that bit of that explosive explosiveness. And so let's look for him to take a step forward this year. But, you know, you've got your left tackle spot locked down. It's the interior of the offensive line that makes people nervous and I get it. When you consider that at the end of the last year, and that's the exercise here, right? At the end of last year, you had Damian Lewis on the left side, who a lot of you have told me over the last couple of months was not good. Um, but he went out and got paid. And then Evan Brown gets away. He was just on a one-year deal, signs with the Cardinals yesterday. And then Anthony Bradford finished the season as the starter at right guard. Well, he's back. And so for the sake of this argument and this exercise, it's the same, right? At right guard anyway, but I have an idea about that. At center, I think we're looking at a potential upgrade because I think since the day they drafted him, I've been a fan of Olu Oluwatimi. I think he was destined to be the long-term center here. I think Nick Harris was signed specifically to be a backup, nothing more. Um, I think it's Oluwatimi's job to lose. I do, and I think he's going to prove to be an upgrade. And so what are you going to do at left guard? Well, first of all, I think, here's my prediction. I think Anthony Bradford is going to be shifted to the left side, similar to what they did with Damian Lewis after his rookie year. Why? Two reasons. Number one, he played he played some guard at LSU, but he also played a lot of left tackle. We used to hear Pete Carroll talk about this a lot, and Schneider some too, that some offensive linemen can play anywhere. Others are left side, right side. Heard Taylor Lewan talking about this. Uh, at the NFL Combine. Um, Anthony Bradford's going to be comfortable on the left side, and now he's com- he's been playing guard full-time now. I think that's a logical shift to make. Put him next to Charles Cross. And the, one of the reasons I think that is because with the signing that they made this week of Tremaine Antrim from the LA Rams, hadn't heard of him, Told you that on the show the other day when he was signed. But when I when I found whatever the tape that I could find on him, first I went back to his his start week two, 2022 against Atlanta, because I thought, hey, he earned the starting job two years ago. Let's see what he had. Third play of the game, he rolls his ankle or he gets rolled up on, tries to fight through it. Next play, he goes down again. He missed the rest of the year. But in the first preseason game last week, I saw that he played almost 70% of the snaps. And I watched that game and immediately within the first seven or eight snaps, I thought this guy's a starting guard in the NFL. He's got quick feet, moves well, good balance, good leverage. He's got a little nastiness to him. He looks, you know, once he realizes what his assignment is, he'll, he'll go, if he doesn't have a guy, right. He'll just go help out on somebody else and just try to drill somebody. Um, good hand usage. Once he gets his arms out and, and gets you locked down, he, he can move you. Um, he looks like a starting guard in the NFL. Well, guess what? He plays right guard. As does, for the most part, McClendon Curtis, who the Seahawks, excuse me, poached off the Raiders practice squad early last year and carried him on the 53 all season long, even though they didn't use him because they wanted to protect him. They felt that good about him. Did the same thing with Raekwon O'Neal, who could figure into this tackle battle as well. But I think as we sit here today, Olu, Olu is the starting center. Anthony Bradford moves over to the left side at left guard, where I think he might be more comfortable. And Tremaine Antrim is your starter at right guard. Now, maybe that's not as good in your mind as Evan Brown at center, Phil Haynes at right guard, and then Damian, Damian Lewis at left guard. But I think it's got the potential to be. And I think when you take all of this as a whole, that's where I, I, I can make the argument that I think this roster is better right now than it was at the end of last season. And you still have 
the draft ahead of you. And I think if your biggest question coming out of what I just talked about is we need a badass franchise guard, good chance they're going to get one in this draft. If you think they need another edge player that's that's more dominant off the edge, good chance they might get that in this draft. Linebacker, you're concerned about linebacker at least beyond this year. If you like Dodson and you like Baker, but you think, well, we need some longevity there, they're certainly going to draft a linebacker in this draft, if not two. And so there will be a guy or two on four-year rookie contracts to add to this mix. What do you think? Am I crazy? Am I overly optimistic? I've been accused of that before. Um, I've been accused of a lot of things. Somebody told me on Twitter the other day that uh, he's glad he didn't have my personality or everyone he talked to would flatline, something like that. I don't know. His observation skills were as poor as his, uh, as his word skills. Anyway, um, I'd like to know your your uh, your thoughts on that. Let me know in the comments. Um, and it, even again, you know, I guess my final thought, just to build off the last one, is even if 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 you think nope, the interior offensive line concerns are so grave that I cannot get on board with what you're saying here, Dan. Well, then I suspect that they'll take care of that in the draft. And certainly, we'll talk more about that. Um, as that comes along, got some cool stuff coming up next week. Uh, Keith Simon's going to join me Monday. He is a longtime quarterback coach, former college offensive coordinator and head coach and quarterback guru. He's coached quarterbacks and he has some really interesting thoughts. Um, we're going to talk about all aspects of quarterbacking. What do you think of this draft class? Um, talk about some quarterback history in uh, Seahawks land as well. Try to reschedule with Jackson Bevins. Sorry for not getting that on the air yesterday. One of the reasons I'm doing this show so late at night tonight is because they are doing some massive renovations on the apartment above me and uh, can't escape it, not even with this microphone. Anyway, I am Dan Viennes. Follow me on Twitter, Seahawks Forever, and uh, be sure to subscribe to the YouTube channel and all the audio channels as well. Forever and always go Hawks. Thanks for watching, you guys.